it's Tuesday, March 22nd, 5.07 p.m. I'm going to read chapter 10 of part 3 of book 4 of The Gestures. This chapter may be divided into the following parts. 1. Attitudes. 2. Circumnambulations and similar movements. 3. Changes of position. This depends upon the theory of the construction of the circle. 4. The knocks or nails. 1. Attitudes are of two kinds, natural and artificial. Of the first kind, prostration is the obvious example. It comes natural to man, poor creature, to throw himself to the ground in the presence of the object of his adoration. The magician must eschew prostration, or even the bending of the knee in supplication, as infamous and ignominious in abdication of his sovereignty. Intermediate between this and the purely artificial form of gesture comes a class which depends on acquired habit. Thus it is natural to a European officer to offer his sword in token of surrender. A Tibetan would, however, squat, put out his tongue, and place his hand behind his right ear. Purely artificial gestures comprehend in their class the majority of definitely magic signs, though some of these stimulate a natural action, e.g. the sign of the rending of the veil. But the sign of Oromoth merely imitates a hieroglyph which has only a remote connection with any fact in nature. All signs must of course be studied with infinite patience, and practiced until the connection between them and the mental attitude which they represent appears necessary. In part two of this book, it was assumed that the magician went barefoot. This would imply his intention to make intimate contact with his circle. But he may wear sandals, for the Ankh is a sandal strap. It is borne by the Egyptian gods to signify their power of going, that is, their eternal energy. By shape, the Ankh, or Crux Sansada, suggests the formula by which this going is effected in actual practice. This is a very definite result, but one which is very difficult to describe. An analogy is the dynamo. Circumnambulation properly performed in combination with the sign of Horus, or the Enterer, on passing the east is one of the best methods of arousing the macrocosmic force in the circle. It should never be omitted unless there be some special reason against it. A particular tread seems appropriate to it. This tread should be light and stealthy, almost furtive, and yet very purposeful. It is the pace of the tiger who stalks the deer. The number of circumnambulations should of course correspond to the nature of the ceremony. Another important movement is the spiral, of which there are two principal forms, one inward, one outward. They can be performed in either direction, and like the circumnambulation, if performed deosil, they invoke, if widdershins, they banish. Such at least is the traditional interpretation, but there is a deeper design which may be expressed through the direction of rotation. Certain forces of the most formidable character may be invoked by circumnambulation widdershins when it is executed with intent toward them in the initiated technique. Of such forces, Typhon is the type, and the war of the Titans against the Olympians the legend. Titan has in Greek the numerical value of 666. In the spiral, the tread is light and tripping, almost approximating to the dance. While performing it, the magician will usually turn on his own axis, either in the same direction as the spiral or in the opposite direction. Each combination involves a different symbolism. There is also the dance proper. It has many forms, each god having his special dance. One of the easiest and most effective dances is the ordinary waltz step combined with the three signs of Lux. It is much easier to attain ecstasy in this way than is generally supposed. The essence of the process consists in the struggle of the will against giddiness. But this struggle must be prolonged and severe, and upon the degree of this, the quality and intensity of ecstasy attained may to some extent depend. With practice, giddiness is altogether conquered. Exhaustion then takes its place as the enemy of will. It is through the mutual destruction of these antagonisms in the mental and moral being of the magician. Good examples of the use of change of position are given in the manuscripts Z1 and Z3, explanatory of the neophyte ritual of the Golden Dawn, where the candidate is taken to various stations in the temple, each station having a symbolic meaning of its own. But in pure invocation, a better example is given in Liber 831. In the construction of a ceremony, an important thing to decide is whether you will or will not make such movements. For every circle has its natural symbolism, and even if no use is to be made of these facts, one must be careful not to let anything be inharmonious with the natural attributions. The practical necessities of the work are likely to require certain movements. One should either exclude the symbolism altogether, or else think out everything beforehand and make it significant. Do not let some actions be symbolic and others haphazard. 
for the sensitive aura of the magician might be disturbed and the value of the ceremony completely destroyed by the embarrassment caused by the discovery of some such error, just as if a preoccupied teetotaler found out that he had strayed into a temple of the demon rum. It is therefore impossible to neglect the theory of the circle. To take a simple example, suppose that in an evocation of Bartzabel, the planet Mars, whose sphere is Jebera severity, were situated actually in the heavens, opposite to the square of Jesed mercy of the Tau in the circle, and the triangle placed accordingly. It would be improper for the magus to stand on that square, unless using this formula, I, from Chesed, rule Jebera through the path of the lion, while, taking an extreme case, to stand on the square of Hod, which is naturally dominated by Jebera, would be a madness which only a formula of the very highest magic could counteract. Certain positions, however, such as Tifereth, are so sympathetic to the magus himself that he may use them without reference to the nature of the spirit or of the operation, unless he requires an exceptionally precise spirit free of all extraneous elements, or one whose nature is difficultly compatible with Tifereth. To show you how these positions may be used in conjunction with the spirals, suppose that you are invoking Hathor, goddess of love, to descend upon the altar. Standing on the square of Netzach, you will make your invocation to her, and then dance an inward spiral deosil, ending at the foot of the altar, where you sink on your knees with your arms raised above the altar as if inviting her embrace, but not in supplication. To conclude, one may add that the natural artistic ability, if you possess it, forms an excellent guide. All art is magic. Isadora Duncan has this gift of gesture in a very high degree. Let the reader study her dancing, if possible rather in private than in public and learn the superb unconsciousness, which is magical consciousness, with which she suits the action to the melody. There is no more potent means than art of calling forth true gods to visible appearance. The knocks or knells are all of the same character. They may be described collectively. The difference between them consists only in this, that the instrument with which they are made seals them with its own special properties. It is of no great importance, even so, whether they are made by clapping the hands or stamping the feet, by struts of one of the weapons, or by the theoretically appropriate instrument, the bell. It may nevertheless be admitted they become more important in the ceremony if the magician considers it worthwhile to take up an instrument whose single purpose is to produce them. Any action not purely rhythmical is a disturbance. Let it first be laid down that a knock asserts a connection between the magician and the object which he strikes. Thus the use of the bell, or of the hands, means that the magician wishes to impress the atmosphere of the whole circle with what has been or is about to be done. He wishes to formulate his will in sound, and radiate it in every direction, moreover, to influence that which lives by breath in the sense of his purpose, and to summon it to bear witness to his word. The hands are used as symbols of his executive power, the bell to represent his consciousness exalted into music. To strike with the wand is to utter the fiat of creation. The cup vibrates with his delight in receiving spiritual wine. A blow with the dagger is like the signal for battle. The disc is used to express the throwing down of the price of one's purchase. To stamp with the foot is to declare one's mastery of the matter in hand. Similarly, any other form of giving knocks has its own virtue. From the above examples, the intelligent student will have perceived the method of interpreting each individual case that may come in question. As above said, the object struck is the object impressed. Thus, a blow upon the altar affirms that he has complied with the laws of his operation. To strike the lamp is to summon the light divine, thus for the rest. It must also be observed that many combinations of ideas are made possible by this convention. To strike the wand within the cup is to apply the creative will to its proper complement, and so perform the great work by the formula of regeneration. To strike with the hand on the dagger declares that one demands the use of the dagger as a tool to extend one's executive power. The reader will recall how Siegfried smote Nothung, the sword of need upon the lance of Wotan. By the action, Wagner, who was instructed how to apply magical formulae by one of the heads of our order, intended his hearers to understand that the reign of authority and paternal power had come to an end, that the new master of the world was intellect. The general object of a knock or a knell is to mark a stage in the ceremony. Sasaki Shigetsu tells us in his essay on Shinto that the Japanese are accustomed to clap their hands four times to drive away evil spirits. He explains that what really happens is that the sudden and sharp impact of the sound throws the mind into an alert activity which enables it to break loose from the obsession of its previous mood. It is aroused to apply itself aggressively to the ideals which had oppressed it. There is therefore a perfectly rational interpretation of the psychological power of the knock. 
In a magical ceremony, the knock is employed for much the same purpose. The magician uses it like the chorus in a Greek play. It helps him to make a clean cut, to turn his attention from one part of his work to the next. So much for the general character of the knock or knell. Even this limited point of view offers great opportunities to the resourceful magician, but further possibilities lie to our hand. It is not usually desirable to attempt to convey anything except emphasis and possibly mood by varying the force of the blow. It is obvious, moreover, that there is a natural correspondence between the hard loud knock of imperious command on the one hand and the soft slurred knock of sympathetic comprehension on the other. It is easy to distinguish between the bang of the outraged creditor at the front door and the hushed tap of the lover at the bedroom door. Magical theory cannot here add instruction to instinct. But a knock need not be single. The possible combinations are evidently infinite. We need only discuss the general principles of determining what number of strokes will be proper in any case, and how we may interrupt any series so as to express our idea by means of structure. The general rule is that a single knock has no special significance as such, because unity is omniform. It represents tether which is the source of all things, equally partaking of any quality by which we discriminate one thing from another. Continuing on these lines, the number of knots will refer to the sephira or other idea kabbalistically cognate with that number. Thus, seven knots will imitate Venus, eleven the great work, seventeen the trinity of fathers, and nineteen the feminine principle in its most general sense. Analyzing the matter a little further, we remark firstly that a battery of too many knocks is confusing, as well as liable to overweight the other parts of the ritual. In practice, eleven is about the limit. It is usually not difficult to arrange to cover all necessary ground with that number. Secondly, each number is so extensive in scope and includes aspects so diverse from a practical standpoint that our danger lies in vagueness. A knock should be well defined, its meaning should be precise. The very nature of knocks suggests smartness and accuracy. We must therefore devise some means of making the sequence significant of the special sense which may be appropriate. Our only resource is in the use of intervals. It is evidently impossible to attain great variety in the smaller numbers, but this fact only illustrates the excellence of our system. There is only one way of striking two knocks, and this fact agrees with the nature of chakma. There is only one way of creating. We can only express ourselves, although we do so in duplex form. But there are three ways of striking three knocks, and these three ways correspond to the threefold manner in which Bina can receive the creative idea. There are three possible types of triangle. We may understand an idea either as a unity tripartite or as an unity dividing itself into a duality, or a duality harmonized into an unity. Any of these methods may be indicated by three equal knocks, one followed after a pause by two, and two followed after a pause by one. As the nature of the number becomes more complex, the possible varieties increase rapidly. There are numerous ways of striking six, each of which is suited to the nature of the several aspects of Tifereth. We may leave the determination of these points to the ingenuity of the student. The most generally useful and adaptable battery is composed of 11 strokes. The principal reason for this are as follows. Firstly, 11 is the number of magic in itself. It is therefore suitable to all types of operation. Secondly, it is the sacred number par excellence of the new eon. As it is written in the Book of the Law, 11 as all their numbers who are of us. Thirdly, it is the number of the letters of the word abrahadabra, which is the word of the eon. The structure of this word is such that it expresses the great work and indicates the formula of the great work in every one of its aspects. Lastly, it is possible thereby to express all possible spheres of operation, whatever their nature. This is effected by making an equation between the number of the sephira and the difference between that number and 11. For example, 2-9 is the formula of the grade of initiation corresponding to Yasad. Yasad represents the instability of air, the sterility of the moon, but these qualities are balanced in it by the stability implied in its position as the foundation and by its function of generation. The complex is further equilibrated by identifying it with the number 2 of Chakma, which possesses the airy quality being the word and the lunar quality being the reflection of the son of Kether as Yasad is of the son of Tifereth. It is the wisdom which is the foundation of immutable law, and corresponds to generation by being creation. This entire cycle of ideas is expressed in the double formula 2-9 and 9-2, and any one of these ideas may be selected and articulated by a suitable battery. We may conclude with a single illustration of how the above principles may be put into practice. Let us suppose that the magician contemplates an operation for the purpose of helping his mind to resist the tendency to wander. 
this will be a work of Yasad, but he must emphasize the stability of that sephira as against the airy quality which it possesses. His first action will be to put nine under the protection of the two. The battery at this point will be one, nine, one, but this nine as it stands is suggestive of the changefulness of the moon. It may occur to him to divide this into four and five, four being the number of fixidity, law, and authoritative power, and five being that of courage, energy, and triumph over the elements. He will reflect, moreover, that four is symbolic of the stability of matter, while five expresses the same idea with regard to motion. At this stage, the battery will appear as one, two, five, two, one. After due consideration, he will probably conclude that to split up the central five would tend to destroy the simplicity of his formula and decide to use it as it stands. The possible alternative would be to make a single knock at the center of his battery as if he appealed to the ultimate immutability of Kether, invoking that unity by placing a fourfold knock on either side of it. In this case, his battery would be 14141. He will naturally have been careful to preserve the balance of each part of the battery against the corresponding part. This would be particularly necessary in an operation such as we have chosen for our example.